Welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we sift through philosophy to find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sadler. And today we are talking about leadership, lying, and legacy. And it doesn't have to be in any particular order. The three L's all kind of go together. And we have a particular case in mind that we're going to be talking about, but I, I think we've got some bigger picture issues as well. So the particular case, if you know anything about professional sports, particularly here in America and most particularly here in Wisconsin, the person that we have in mind is Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback, starting quarterback, since there's more than one, for the Green Bay Packers. And recently we got to see a side of him that was uh, surprising to a lot of us, I would say. And I think there's some other um, emotions, emotion words that go along with that, dismaying, demoralizing, for some infuriating. Um, I, am I, what am I leaving out? There's others. Befuddlement? Befuddlement, yeah. Um, which is sort of like being amazed, only not such a good way. <laughs> what else? Any others that come to mind? Um. You said surprise, yes. Um, yeah. Eh. I, no, mean, I think we, we pretty much covered the gambit there. Wonder, in the sense like, I wonder what is going through this guy's head. Mm -hmm. That could be one. And what are, what are we talking about here? Well, he came down with COVID. And he wasn't supposed to come down with COVID, although people do, even if they've been vaccinated. And the reason why we all thought it was weird that he came down with COVID is because he wasn't vaccinated. And apparently people within the Packers organization knew that he wasn't. And of course, he knew that he wasn't. But all the rest of us were very surprised by that. And this this broke, uh, you know, the other thing I want to say about this before we jump right in. So there were there was some immediate reactions to it by the media, people who are already Rogers detractors, you know, saying, oh, this, look at this terrible guy. And then he made things worse for himself in a whole bunch of ways we're going to talk about. Um, but it's been almost a month, so I think that's enough time. I don't know. What, what's your view on this, Dan? Is that enough time to get some sort of cold objectivity about what's going on? It's not, no longer such of a hot topic. Yeah, the, the hot takes have definitely subsided, and I, I think you know, a month is definitely a good time for us to do this retrospective. And I do want to like preface this, uh, okay. both Greg and I are fans of the Green Bay Packers. Indeed, um, yeah, yeah. And I believe that we're both fans of you know, Rodgers as a, um, at least a very much a, a football player, um, and have been impressed with some of the things that he's done off the field as well in the past. Yeah, I, I would say that that's quite correct. And I don't want people to take what we're doing here as just like character assassination or anything like that because we're not we're not doing that you know the things that we have to say here are informed by philosophy we've got a lot of uh, passages taken from things people have actually said about this including what rogers himself has said which will surprise a lot of people if they if they haven't uh already read it heard it um but there is there's something troubling about this, right? Right, and I guess one of the ways that I, I like to look at a lot of these things are um, this idea of, of roles and roles that people take on, mm, and so yeah. you know, we all hold a lot of different roles. You often hear the idea of um, uh, I am a multiplicity, on mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that you know Rogers has many roles, both as uh, quarterback and then also leader and then community member and you know uh, fiance at the moment um and uh you know family member and uh, j just member of the general public um i guess that I would also consider you know him being a citizen yeah and um we can all look at how he acts in each one of these different ways um and define th that how he's acted as either good or bad but that doesn't necessarily follow that the others have to be in concordance with that accordance with that 
Yeah, I, I think role ethics will be something that we're going to hit on quite a bit, particularly in relation to the leadership part of it. You know, maybe there's some things that are, you know, it's not as if ordinary people who aren't leaders can get away with doing things that leaders can't, you know, per se, but maybe there's like a spectrum, you know, you have, you have greater responsibility if you're a leader. We should say something though, a little bit, just in case anybody's tuning into this and they're like, well, who, who's this? What are we talking about? What's the football? You know, um, who's, who's Aaron Rodgers? He's, you know, our starting quarterback, uh, for the Green Bay Packers. Um, some people might need some explanation of that. That's part of, you know, the National Football League, which is, you know, for anybody listening overseas, uh, obviously the American football, right? And um, he's been around for a long time. He was drafted in 2005, which meant he became part of the team. And he was, um, you know, at that time, they, we already had like a star quarterback in Brett Favre. And then when Favre left, Aaron Rodgers stepped up and became the starter in 2008. So, you know, he's been basically running the show for the offense for what now is this this would be 13 years wouldn't it yeah and just to give some more clarification the the quarterback position is kind of like the i don't guess you could call it a field general it's the the leader of the offense when the offense is on the field um as well as within um nfl as like a greater thought um you know, the quarterback are usually the face of a franchise, um, as well as Rodgers himself is uh, has won the Super Bowl with the Packers. That's a big deal, um, yeah. And has, uh, I believe, three MVP awards. He is That's right, on yeah. the national stage. Yeah, and, and to add more to this, um, he's what what they call an elite quarterback. So he's up in the stratosphere. He's sort of the the person that a lot of other people want to catch and perhaps surpass someday. But he keeps on, you know, progressing. He also functions as a leader going beyond the quarterback position. You could say that he's sort of like a semi coach at this point. I think him coming back, um, getting to decide who would come back with him, you know, they basically structured the the team around him. That that makes him a little bit different. And he has a, a really significant media and advertising presence. So you see the guy on TV. He has co-hosted Jeopardy. I think that's, you know, that kind of changed his status in certain ways as well, right? He's had a, a cameos on a number of uh, TV shows, including The Office and Game of Thrones. Oh, right, right. Uh, I as, forgot about that. <laughs> as well as he uh, used to be the team rep for the NFL Players Association, mm. the Players Union. Uh, so, so that that is another place where it was uh, like the definition of what he was doing in that role was to be a leader. So we're talking about somebody who. At least, you know, given all this, strikes uh, strikes us as pretty intelligent and thoughtful, somebody who can exercise leadership, gen- generally motivated by, by goodwill, right? Yeah, he's done a lot of charity work in the past, and, and it's at least, you know, from an outside observer, seems to be rather generous in that regard. Like, now, none of us can see into the, the brain of... Aaron Rodgers. Well, no, this is an interesting thing that you just said, because Uh, you're right. We can't, you know, usually we can only see what's being projected out there. But sometimes people will say things that open the book, so to speak, right? You get to see inside their head. And what we saw um, is a little troubling, (laughs) to say the least. Right. (laughs) So let's 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 tell some of the backstory about before we get to the the significant day when he got COVID. Mm. Um, what is it that we didn't know about what was happening? Um, so I guess uh, their COVID happened. If you haven't heard about that, then you've been under a rock um, for at least a year and a half. Which means um, that you're probably and, safe then, right? You're not mixing with people. Hopefully. <laughs> um. It is pernicious. Um, but yes, uh, and so there were, like, the last season was significantly truncated in the way of uh, attendance. Um, they uh, made it so that, like, almost any home game or uh, was 
almost no attendance. They've right. um, as we've got the vaccine, we've uh, the wow, I was saying we the NFL has relaxed uh, standards. Um, it was you know early on, it was like if you had vaccines and you could go into the games. Now it's basically just uh, carte blanche. But like the big thing was at least in response to the the requirements for the players themselves, as there are a number of uh, protocols that the NFL uh, negotiated with the NFL Players Union, and all sides agreed to these particular uh, protocols, and which include things like um, if you uh, unvaccinated players test positive, they are uh, have to re- remain isolated for a period of 10 days and must be asymptomatic after their turn. Um, other protocols are um, testing every day, uh, wearing a mask in team facilities, um, no in-person interviews um, without a mask, or they are uh, using a video conference system. Mm. And um, a requirement to quarantine for five days if deemed a close contact with any teammate who has already contracted COVID-19. Yeah, so basically you've got like the 2020 standards, which everybody was going along with that Dan just narrated. And then if you actually got yourself vaccinated, which it turns out, you know, quite a few players didn't, um, and that's a whole different issue, then you're stuck with those old standards. If you did get vaccinated, which the majority of players seem to have done, then things are a lot easier for you. You know, Um, you could still get sick, but um, if that player test positive and then they do two consecutive negative tests 24 hours apart, they can go right back. So this makes a big difference for the NFL where every week they are playing games. So um, Rogers actually said something about the guidelines. He said, there is a lot of conversation about it around the league and a lot of guys have made statements and not made statements. And then he said, there's guys on the team that haven't been vaccinated I think it's a personal decision. I'm not going to judge those guys. So that makes it sound a little bit like he's actually gotten vaccinated, doesn't it? Right? Yeah, he's he's referring to them in <laughs> the them and not we. Exactly. And then he says um, there are guys who are that are vaccinated that have contracted COVID. It's an interesting issue that I think we're going to see played out the entire season. So, you know, what uh, what is that? Um. <laughs> how prophetic yeah exactly um and and it makes it sound very much like you know he's just on the sidelines and obviously he's been taken care of and well those other guys i want to be respectful of them and he's one of them so what else do we find out he had an alternate treatment prior to the start of training camp and then he wanted that treatment to be considered the same as somebody who got vaccinations. As it turns out, that treatment was homeopathy given to him by his doctor. Um, If you don't know what homeopathy is, it's definitely not something accepted by the medical establishment here, which is part of what, you know, often fuels their, oh, we're persecuted and they're trying to keep the stuff under wraps. And one way of summarizing it is to say you take a little bit of something to provoke some kind of reaction or, you know, a little bit of something bad will help you feel better. Um, And there's there's no scientific basis to it or, or you know, acknowledged Wait. medical basis to it. Right. You, you you put something into water and you shake it up and then you pour that out and have a little bit left of that and you add some more water and you shake that up and you do this ad infinitum to the point where the, the water has a memory of the thing that used to be in it. Um, yeah. So we're talking stuff that's essentially pseudoscience, right? And or if you want, uh, you know, alternative medicine. But there's a an interesting quote I believe by the Tim Minchin that alternative medicine, if it were medicine, they just call it medicine. Well, you know, and I, I kind of think 
So this is a little bit of a tangent. Some alternative mm -hmm. medicine is probably closer to medicine than other forms of alternative medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, like you know, I, I remember I had I had a, a friend who was into homeopathy, and when I would get sick, she would give me some echinacea. And echinacea actually does does help you out a bit, but it's not as helpful, say, as antibiotics you know, or things mm -hmm. like that. Um, and, and, you know, it, it could be that down the line, 20 years from now, 100 years from now, there'll be a lot of alternative medicines that will get incorporated. But the people who are, I'm going to make a probably a terrible generalization here. The people that are really, really big boosters of alternative medicine are usually all about that. And they're pretty hostile to, you know, what we regular call medicine. It. Yeah, regular. I was going to say traditional, but... <laughs> <laughs> they they often say that what they're doing is more traditional, right? Right. And I guess I have no problem with alternative medicine um, once it's been tested and proven to actually have some effect. Yeah. Um, I'm not really interested in it. Um, hopefully it's uh, – I guess the, the big thing would be any alternative medicines that actually do have a negative effect. Yeah, yeah. Now, interestingly with this – uh, so Rogers petitioned the league and they took him seriously and they had doctors look at it. And then the doctors were like, this is not going to count as vaccination. You know, it, it'd be like if let's say you did something with uh, accepted medicine and you're like, yeah, you know, I'm just going to take antibiotics every day. The doctors still would not be cool with that. They wouldn't say, well, that's just as good as getting the COVID vaccine. You know, it, it, the COVID vaccine, in order to be vaccinated, you need to be vaccinated. It's as as basic as that and and that comes down to this this press conference <laughs> yes <laughs> on august 26 and a what? reporter asked him point blank are you vaccinated and he responds yeah i'm immunized yeah no. and now we're talking semantics and there's there's a name for well there's there's two things going on there one one is what we can call ambiguity right where a term can mean multiple things so when you hear immunized in relation to being asked a question about vaccination i think most of us would naturally say oh okay immunized he he means being vaccinated right but he right. didn't mean that <laughs> no he's once again, we talked about it, uh, that he had some sort of a homeopathic cure, which he believed to have made him, uh, at least his immune system, into something that was um, able to fend off this particular strain of COVID, or yeah. I guess this family of COVID. Yeah. So then he gets COVID. And now the story changes, right? He tests positive for COVID, and a lot of people are like, well, how did this happen? You know, it's sort of like when somebody gets pregnant and people are like, how did this happen? And you're like, well, <laughs> you know, we covered this in health class. It's not that difficult to understand. Right. Um, and a lot of people get on his case. So Rogers makes matters worse by going on the Pat McAfee show and giving an interview in which he uses a surprisingly large amount of hard right language and claims. So I'm just going to read some of the stuff he actually said. I realize I'm in the crosshairs of the woke mob right now. So before my final nail gets put into my cancel culture casket, I think I'd like to set the record straight on so many of the blatant lies that are out there about myself. First of all, I didn't lie in the initial press conference. During that time, it was a witch hunt that was going on across the league where everybody in the media was so concerned about who was vaccinated and what that meant and who was being selfish and who would talk about it. And what it meant if they said it's a personal decision and they shouldn't have to disclose their own medical information and whatnot. And at the time, my plan was to say I've been immunized. It wasn't some sort of ruse or lie. It was the truth. So now notice he's making claims about other people lying and that he didn't lie. And what he did was he told the truth. So he is either lying at the time that he's actually saying that in the interview because he's saying un untrue things about his own statements or everything that he's saying is is completely true and then we should buy that um, narrative of witch hunts and woke mobs and cancel culture which i myself find a little hard to to buy i, I mean were you persuaded in any way by this uh, declaration 
No. <laughs> um, it, it was... When I first heard this, because I actually listened to this live. Yeah. I was like, okay, this this isn't feeling great. And it just kind of got worse from there in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Um. So, you know, he's using that ambiguity to try to, like, you know, weasel his way out and to, at least in his own mind, say, I'm not lying. Yeah. Um. And if you know that people are going to assume one thing with the way that you are using words, especially if someone says, are you vaccinated? And you give a uh, answer, you know, like in an affirmative sense. Yeah, I'm immunized. Yeah. Um, You know, he says, yes, I've been immunized, which would be demonstrably false if, you know, when they ask you, were you vaccinated? That yes references the vaccine, right? Well, see, this is where we, like you said, it's a matter of semantics, right? It's how we parse it. And and this is where I think, as a rule of thumb, when there's questions about whether somebody's being truthful or lying, we shouldn't just, like, accept their their story about what they really meant to say or what they were, what they were um, meaning at the time. We have to be skeptical about that, as we would with anybody else who's trying to, in effect, con us. You know, and then this leads to another one. He ends up saying that he's allergic to an in- ingredient in the mnra vaccines, um, and that's why he he did the thing he did. I mean, nobody knows whether that's true or not. Does he really have an allergy to it? Um, when you say a whole bunch of other, it's sort of like the what's that old story about the the boy who cried wolf, right? Um, you lie about stuff a couple times, you erode trust, and. Um, it's, I think there's a lot of people I think who don't buy this. I'm allergic in a weird way that hardly anybody else is to these, these vaccines. Um, he also, you know, made claims, um, that are coming from other people about how vaccines could affect fertility and says he wants to be a daddy someday. And so that's another reason for not taking the vaccines. (laughs) Yeah. But if you have a, a reason if you're using that as a reason, then you have to be able to place some evidence that that is a thing in which it is. Yeah. And and apparently he found some things that are not really studies, but let's call them literature for lack of a better word that makes those claims, but they're not anything that's really accepted in the medical community. And, and you could say, Oh, the medical community is trying to hide it. But then we get into all this conspiracy theory stuff. And then, then we have to have like whole different standards of evidence and truth. I think. Yeah. If he wants to be like, part of the marketplace of truth, he can't just appeal to stuff that most people are not going to, going to accept. Right. Right. Like, uh, if, if he's making an argument to us, um, you know, it, think of like a syllogism um if this yeah uh, we both need to agree on whatever this is that you're um you're making as your first uh, portion of your argument yeah and if we're not agreeing on this then we're not going to be able to continue on with that uh argument because at least that that first point isn't sound it doesn't have enough backing um to be accepted by all parties or even the vast majority of parties yeah, there's there's an sort of commitments when you're involved in public discourse that you have to honor. And you know, actually, I'm going to jump ahead to something that I I think is is kind of a lesson not just about Aaron Rodgers but about people involved in in leadership positions who end up lying about things. Often what ends up happening because they want to have things both ways. They want to, on the one hand, have their status acknowledged and be able to claim a certain space for themselves. But they also do this, oh, we're, we all just have different opinions, you know, and you can't have both of these operative at the same time. You know, if, if all of our opinions are just as good as everybody else's, well, then, you know, my opinion that he lied is just as good as his, his opinion that he didn't. If we If he wants to be believed, he has to sort of like, buy into the same, whatever we want to call it, you know, um, rules of the marketplace of ideas or, you know, 
uh, semantic requirements. And then, you know, there's, there's a couple other things that, that came out of this that are, when we talk about these being troubling. So he said that um, everybody on the squad knew he wasn't vaccinated. Everybody in the organization knew he wasn't vaccinated. I wasn't hiding it from anybody. I was trying to minimize and mitigate this conversation that would go on and on. So if, if everybody knew, then why was it such a surprise to all of us? And if the whole organization knew, that seems to me to be kind of a problem. You know, it, it's like the, the organization was also covering for him as well. Right. That's, that's a big can of worms, but I, I kind of wanted to hit on, you know, We've been talking about it. Yeah. But what is lying? Let's let's kind of define some oh. terms a little bit. Yeah. Um, so that we are or standing on some solid ground here. You know, there is a great book by this uh, this philosopher. It's a classic now um, called um, Lying, and it's by Cicela Bach. And she does a, this wonderful overview of like the literature, the philosophical literature on lying, all the way back to the pre-Socratics and going through to the to the present. And there's two features that she zeroes in on that most theories that talk about truth and lying make central. One is that there has to be like an intent to deceive. So, you know, if I'm not actually trying to deceive you, then maybe I'm not lying. So, for example, if I'm, you know, pretending to be a character in a play, I'm not lying because I'm not, I'm not deceiving you. I'm not trying to get you to believe something that isn't true. And the other thing is that, that she um, says is, is really important for a lot of theories is if I'm lying to you, I have to, I'm, I have to aim to substitute falsity for truth or something that's false for something that's true. And what this would preclude, it would be, you know, people who are themselves um, mistaken. So if Rogers, to take him as an example, if Rogers really does believe that homeopathy is just as good or perhaps even better than the vaccines, that it's just as effective, then according to that, he's not lying. He's doing something different. He's spreading misinformation, which is also bad. Um, he's being a rube. Um, and he's been deceived by other people who either were deceived themselves and, and then just passed it on or who lied to him. Um, but he's not lying in that case, right? Right. This is, you know, this came up uh, a lot of times in the the last administration mm. about like, oh, they're telling a, it's an untruth. They yeah. believe it to be true, but it does not actually, you know, have a reference in reality. Um, but the question is, is how does one know when someone is intentionally deceiving and yeah. when they are actually believing this thing and they're just incorrect that's a great question and so like with the trump administration we could say um track record right i mean the guy spouts lies all the time uh a lot of the time it appears like he he you know actually they call him the the, the bullshitting president right because harry frankfurt came up with this this book that um defined that term and that's not just lying Per se, it's sort of like a total disregard for what's true and what's false anyway. And, and I think that is characteristic of that administration and, and of Trump. There were probably a lot of hangers on who were deliberately lying. Um, but in the case of Rogers, in a way, his being in good faith in the past and his intelligence works against him. He's, you can say, how could you actually believe this sort of thing and put it forward? How could you not know, you know, you're a smart guy. I don't know. What do you think of that? That sort of response. Are, are more intelligent people? Do they, do they are they held to a higher standard when it comes to truth and lying, or should they be rather? Uh, this is this is interesting. Um, because <laughs> like, uh, the first thing is like Rogers considers himself at least uh, a trivia buff, and he considers himself to be a rather smart right. individual. Yeah, and, and he has a really good ability to retain a lot of information. Um, but just like, you know, um, I wouldn't ask a, a doctor to work on my car, um, nor am I asking Rogers to do a lot of things that are outside of his wheelhouse. Yeah. And so this kind of comes down to, um, there's the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, and when, um, you don't know, then you don't know how much you don't know. And... 
the problem is that he is a smart guy. Um, at least he has, uh, and and within the world of uh, football, he is incredibly smart as a quarterback. He can like he has almost eidetic memories about all of his previous plays, um, and he knows how to dissect and and come to really good conclusions that result in him being able to be a very good quarterback. Yeah. Um, but um, that doesn't mean that he is really good at uh, anything Medicine. else that is like <laughs> totally out of his wheelhouse. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and so you, you see this a lot with, with other people like businessmen or doctors or whatnot who will you know pontificate about things that are totally outside of their uh, direct expertise. And because they have such a experience of being either the smartest guy in the room or the decision maker, they speak with really good authority and they can you know self-deceive themselves to thinking that they know a lot more than they do. You know, this is something that's actually pointed out in Plato's Apology, where Socrates is explaining um, to the people who he's on trial with uh, and who are ultimately going to find him guilty and condemn him to death, why it is that prejudice has arisen against him. And he talks about three groups of people that he's managed to tick off by showing that they don't know as much as they claim to. And one group are the, we could call them like the media people. The, he calls them the poets and the writers. I mean, these days they'd be like the people, you know, doing journalism or creating TV shows or stuff like that. And he, sh- he, he claims to show that they don't know anything about anything, which is probably wrong. And then there's the politicians who he shows are just basically successful, but don't know how they're successful. But then there's the craftspeople. And the craftspeople, Socrates says, they did know something. They knew what their craft was. So if somebody's a plumber, he understands plumbing, if he's a good plumber. If he's a bad plumber, maybe not so much. You know, um, If somebody's an NFL quarterback, if Socrates were around, maybe they understand you know, the rules of the game and how to do a hard count and you know, um, even maybe some things outside of that, like how to hold a good conference after the game and explain what happened without sounding uh, dumb. But that doesn't translate into knowing anything else. And Socrates says the problem with all of those people is exactly what you pointed out. They think that because they're smart in one area that they've got sort of a universal smartness. And, and, you know, interestingly, in that interview, Rogers calls himself a critical thinker. And being a critical thinker or doing your own research is the popular phrase these days. Um, there's a lot of ways to do that. I'm, I'm not going to knock doing your own research altogether, but if you're not, if you don't actually have qualifications or at least a rudimentary education in the field, you're probably not going to be able to do research in any real sense in that field, even armed with all the cool stuff that the internet makes available, like YouTube videos and Wikipedia and WebMD and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I guess one of the, the the most humbling experiences going to college is that you go into your major and you're like, oh yeah, I know something about this. And yeah. so for me, it was computer science. And I go in and I'm like, oh, this is a lot more that I don't know. And you get deeper and it's like, there's even more that I don't know. And you're like, okay, well, I need to specialize. And you pick this one little tiny like bit of the thing and you're like okay i can become an expert in this really 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 tiny little thing yeah um but uh, is you know if you take it as like filling up a circle of all of human knowledge it is is less than a thousandth of a percent of the diameter um not the diameter the circumference of this particular wheel that i am aware of and everything else out there like i i I've got a lot of like general knowledge, but I'm not going to try to make too many pronouncements because mostly I use my general knowledge just to be able to have conversations. Yeah. And even if you're in a field that's um, less exactly partitioned, right? If you're an expert, you, you spend a lot of time saying, well, I'm not really that sure about this or that, right? Rather than being the, the sage on the stage, you know, the guru. The guru types usually are, are uh, full of it, right? Well, we should come back to the story and we'll come back to the lying stuff and, and, and some more deep dive. But we should talk about some of the things that were even more problematic 
Um, Rogers got mad at the fans for not responding to him in the way that he would have liked. He thought that he'd actually like explained himself and done a great job. And a lot of people were like, this guy's totally out of touch. And then he issued a non-apology. And, and one of the things that I think we should think about is, are non-apologies really another form of telling lies? So he says, I understand people are suffering. This has been a really difficult time for the past two years on so many people. We all know individuals who've lost their lives, people who've lost their businesses, livelihoods, their way of life has been altered completely. And I empathize with those things. So far, so good, right? And then he says, um, I just want to start off the show acknowledging I made some comments that people might have felt were misleading. To anybody who felt misled by those comments, I take full responsibility for those comments. Now, taking full responsibility, this is what we call a performative speech act. When you say, I take responsibility, I am sorry, I did the wrong thing, I will fix things, right? These are all part of the language of apology. But when you apologize to somebody and you're saying, oh, I'm sorry that you felt that I X, Y, Z, or I'm sorry that I made you that I made you feel offended. That's different than saying, I'm sorry, I offended you. Right. Or let alone, I did something wrong. I'm sorry, I lied to you. He's not apologizing for anything other than people having felt that his comments were misleading. So he's not taking responsibility, right? It, it takes the, the onus or the, like the, um, the person who committed the, 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 the act, um, from himself yeah. making a statement that, um, is very easily misinterpreted, um, and says, Oh, you didn't understand exactly what I meant. Um, and thus, that's your problem, not mine. Yeah. And I kind of think that, I mean, e e there's one of two things happening here. Either he doesn't understand how language works and he's kind of deluding himself, which I find kind of implausible myself. Or he's, he's doing something that's kind of like lawyer-esque. You know, you see CEOs of corporations doing this when they make bad apologies as well. And nowadays they usually get caught out on it. People put it on Twitter and they're like, look at this non-apology. Um, I, I think if you say that you're taking responsibility or you say that you're apologizing, there has to be more than just that statement backing it up, especially if the problem was people feel it'd be different to like you said oh man I, I scratched your truck when i backed into it um i'm really sorry about that you know or i'm sorry that your truck so, uh, bad things happened and i'm sorry that that happened right but if the problem is that you lied to people in the first place giving an apology that's not a real apology is like adding a second lie on top of it isn't it right this um this reminds me of oh in I guess pop culture. Dan Harmon, who's actually also from Milwaukee, um, who's the creator of Community as well as Rick and Morty, um, I was uh, inappropriate with one of his writers at work while he was working. Ah, uh, shoot, I can't remember exactly. Um, but he went through this whole thing of like the non-apology, and um, you mean he made a non-apology, or yeah, and then okay. he got called out on it hardcore. Um. And he then, like, went back and, like, realized how incredibly bad that was mm. um, and and actually, like, went through and made a really um, sincere and um, actionable apology uh, that was actually an apology. And so like, the one thing that I really wanted to get out of this is not only do you have to take a responsibility for the thing that you did. Yeah. You need to also figure out how you can try to not do that thing in the, f the future, as well as do something to at least mitigate the damage that has already been done by the thing that you did. Yeah. And otherwise, it would just, it's, it's speech acts. You know, it's like, I said this thing to try to placate the masses for being mad at me when you're actually not solving anything. Yeah. And, and this can apply not just to public figures, this can go for personal apologies as well, right? Mm-hmm.
Yeah, absolutely. You, know, you think of like your kids and you go, oh, go, go apologize to Billy. <laughs> and they're like, I'm sorry. Um, and then they turn around but, like, and smack what does that him do? Again. Yeah, it's like you, you, you've made someone say something. Yeah. Um, yeah. But does it actually change any of the, the feelings or the, um, the way that they're looking at it? And I guess for children of that age, it really reminds me of like, um, to there's a, a technique of saying okay um uh billy uh, you you heard jimmy over there um you make the face through it. yeah yeah and, and make the face of how they feel yeah because to try to like you know hit jumpstart that empathy thing do you know where i see interesting things like this come up as a uh, a professor in plagiarism so almost every semester I'll have a student who engages in some plagiarism. And, and oftentimes it's because they waited until the last minute and they got to copy something. So maybe, you know, they might be copying something from a fellow student or they might be um, more often just copying something from the Internet. And I can tell right away, you know, that it's not their own stuff. If, it, if they're copying it from another student while I grade the stuff, I'm like, wow, this looks really familiar. <laughs> You know, and then I try to see who handed in the thing first or, you know, how things work. And if it's something from the Internet, it doesn't match their own writing. You know, it's it's usually better than their own writing. And so then I, I give them a zero on the assignment because I'm not really a hard case with this sort of thing. I give them a zero and I say, I caught you plagiarizing. That's a violation of the student honesty code or whatever it's called at their school. And don't do it again. You know, because if you do it again, then I will be, you know, I won't be quite so so nice about it. And the reactions are the things that are most telling. So the good students will be like, oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I ran out of time. This isn't me. You know, and you're like, OK, well, don't do it again. You know, you know now that I'm like looking out for it. So many other students will be like, well, I didn't plagiarize. I just like looked at the website and I'm not sure how those words got onto my paper. But, you know, I think I got some of the same ideas like floating around in my head. And they spin this big narrative of lies out to cover up the plagiarism. And you're like, just stop. I don't believe you to begin with, you know, and this is so incredibly implausible and you, you plagiarized. It's an objective thing. I can show you where the, the things are are copied from. But this need to like not have done something wrong. I think that's part of what, what lies behind it. Not to be able to tell oneself that, no, I didn't do anything wrong. It's like that meme that goes around uh, from The Simpsons uh, with the principal Skinner. Am I wrong? No, it's the children who are wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> so everybody else in the world has to be, has to be wrong. That's not a way to um, restore trust, which th this is one of the big problems with lying. And this is where we get to talking about the legacy thing. It, and leadership, it really erodes trust. And that is what you need if you want to be a full member of, you know, a, a group or an organization. Yeah, this is really the basis of, like, being part of that group. Um, yeah. And and what I was, uh, what came up to my mind was, like, I still like Rogers, mm -hmm. and definitely, I'm not you know his woke mob or anything. I want him to be better. I, I, this is definitely a, a moment, just like your students, yeah. as a learning experience. They ha he got some um, negative feedback, um, and if he doesn't want to have that negative feedback in the future, he needs to do something to rectify that and not, you know, and actually take responsibility and not a non-apology responsibility. This is a good place for us to sort of jump ahead. I don't think we're going to get to everything that we plan to talk about, but some of the reactions by others um, in professional sports, I think, are very telling. And I think one of the things that, that is indeed troubling about it is, well, what you know, the, the legacy stuff, it's not just Rogers himself. It's all the different people that he's connected with. So Matt LaFleur, the coach, wouldn't comment on any player or coach's vaccination status, which I think is a mistake. You know, I mean, if he wants to clear the air, he should like tell us exactly who's vaccinated and who isn't. And then he was asked whether Roger's use of the word immunized was misleading. And he said, that's a great question for Aaron. I'm not going to comment on it. What do you make of that? Well, the first one, I think that they can't actually discuss um, 
vaccination who's status? immunized or not. I, I think that's a, a league rule. Yeah. Um, so well, I'm wrong about that know, then. Then saying that he should do that, right? Um, uh, but yeah, definitely. Um, no, the, the the question of immunize is definitely within his purview. Of you know, what did he take away from that? And especially if he knew, um, what he actually meant by that, and everyone else, you know, reported it as him being vaccinated. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's he's uh basically allowing. The general populace, as well as the entire um, crew of reporters uh, who are seeing him face to face, um, this lie in which uh, he's not actually, you know, vaccinated. That brings up another really important point. You know, we often call the reporters and the media the fourth estate, meaning that they actually have like a stake in our community. And if we can't rely on people to provide reporters with accurate information, that's that's a real problem because those reporters are the stand ins for people like you and me who don't have the time to go and pester sports figures or whoever else to see whether they've they've done this or that thing that they, they're supposed to do, you know. It'd be like if they and, made, and I think oh go ahead uh, like I, I do as, as far as I know understand um that uh he was breaking protocol in having right. in person maskless conferences and yeah. he does make an argument that is like oh well I'm tested every morning um but that's you're you you've agreed to a certain set of um rules both not not just directly imposed on you by the league or the team but also agreed upon by the players union in yeah. which uh you know he is as a member on um, you know at least tacitly agrees to the the rules and regulations of that uh, governing board and um, so so this him, is yeah this is interesting yeah. because what it shows is not just Rogers violating something being a bad agent on one side but also other people not holding him to the standards they should have been holding him to. And Andrew Brandt had something really interesting to say in his column. He said, readers of the space know my favorable bias towards Aaron Rodgers as a player and a person. Even with my pro Aaron bias, I can't defend his comments. Uh, although some of the criticism has been over the top, his immunization answer regarding his vaccination status was intentionally misleading. I cannot defend it. I get it. He's seen criticisms uh, on players like Kirk Cousins and Carson Wentz for not being vaccinated and knowing he took an alternative treatment he believed gave him immuni immunity, he intentionally chose to use that term, but it was wrong and it was deceitful, he knew what he was being asked. So that's that's the Rogers side. And then he says, it appears that the NFL, the Packers, and the, the Players Union all knew he was blowing off that protocol, yet we've not heard about sanctions. Now, there were some a little bit later. As to Green Bay allowing this, my sense is it had a choice of either one, upsetting its superstar and forcing him to mask up, or two, appeasing him while noting other violations around the league and accepting whatever comes in the form of penalty. So, you know, when when Rodgers, you know, violates these rules and also lies about it, it doesn't just look bad for him or not just look bad. It doesn't just reflect a lack of trustworthiness and truthfulness on his part. It also reflects it on the league and the Packers organization. And, you know, to jump um, to one of the repercussions from this, um, State Farm at first seemed like they were taking his commercials completely out of rotation. And then State Farm said, um, you know, because he's got all these these commercials with them. They said, uh, we don't support the statements that he's made, but we respect his right to have his own personal point of view. Um, our mission at State Farm is to support safer, stronger communities to that. And we encourage vaccinations, but it respect everybody's right to make a choice based on their own personal circumstances, which is kind of just lawyer talk for, you know, we're going to let people do whatever they want. And so they kept his commercials on and then they lowered the amount of his commercials about 90%. So very few of his commercials were getting through. 
And then they wouldn't admit that they were doing that. They, when they were questioned about it, they said, oh, you know, we just kind of like, you know, we strategically put commercials. This is all a bunch of corporate gobbledygook. Um, so, so in effect, Rogers drew State Farm into this morass of self-serving lying, you know. And it looks bad for State Farm. Whereas like, the, you know, Previa Health, they ended their partnership with Rogers. Um, over over this, they they took a hard stance. They were like, "Nope, we're not doing it." I was kind of disappointed to see State Farm, who originally looked like they were going to back off from this and say, "Listen, unless you get your act together, you're not you're not um, going to be doing these commercials for us." I was kind of disappointed to see them, and I like the State Farm commercials. I was disappointed to see them um, take the the route that they did, and I kind of feel like, um, I mean. It's kind of stupid, I suppose, on my part to expect an insurance company to be upstanding and, you know, truthful and stuff like that, uh, you know, especially in advertising, which is by its very nature, almost always deceptive. <laughs> so that may be foolish on my part. But I kind of think State Farm got tarnished and I kind of think the NFL's got tarnished and I kind of think the Packers organization is getting tarnished by this. Yeah, and you, you, it makes sense that the the one organization that stuck to their guns hard was a medical organization. And yeah, you have someone who That's is espousing things that are the opposite core values of that medical organization. Yeah. I, I would also absolutely, uh, I, I can, I'm not endorsing the other people for their decisions, um, but I understand why they have made them because they're uh, they see well rogers makes a lot of people a lot of money that's true and yeah. it is in their core interest to keep that flow on but this is the same reason that many many powerful and rich individuals throughout history who've had you know laws and rules you know not quite apply to them because they're it's in too many other people's interests to keep them where they're at yeah. And, you know, you mentioned like this could be a teachable moment or, you know, a time of reflection. Doing that sort of thing, coddling is least likely to produce that effect, right? It's, it's only when you actually hold people's feet to the proverbial fire that it's likely that they're going to feel a sense of being convicted or however else you want to put it. You know, going, you brought up uh, medical people, and I did have a few quotes here from some medical professionals. Um, one person, Dr. William uh, Schaffner, uh, said, any very public figure who first of all is duplicitous and then makes misstatements certainly is contrary to what we're trying to achieve from a public health perspective. And that's that's very clear, right? He says, immunize has a very specific meaning. It's in the dictionary. It doesn't mean some nonspecific protection. So that's what doctors have to say about that. I think that's kind of important. And then Al Dr. Allison Natzel said, um, it's just as disappointing as a Wisconsinite, as a Packers fan, as a doctor. We're fighting this twin pandemic of coronavirus, but also this misinformation. He's, meaning Rogers, in a position to really motivate the state of Wisconsin and the nation at large to get vaccinated, you know. And our vaccination rates here in, in Wisconsin are still in the, as far as I know, 50s at this point in time. You know, we have a long way to go. And that's, you know, that's not people who have got boosters. That's like people who got their first round. So, you know, what about this thing about setting an example? Uh, we, you know, we started out talking about roles early on. This is something that ties in with leadership and with legacy. Is Rogers, not, put, put aside the lying part, the not getting immunized, this endorsing, you know, pseudoscience and stuff like that as an alternative for vaccination, is that setting a bad example that that is ethically problematic? I would say so, um, although I'm not totally surprised on, um, you know, you if you followed Rogers for years like I have. Yeah. You know, he's he's every once in a while he says something that's like a little bit like head scratchy, like. He likes UFOs and whatnot. It's like a lot of, and for the most part, I threw that away because it's like, okay, people can like UFOs and stuff without actually believing that they are in fact real. Right. Um, I guess as well as like 
I don't know how much time you spent in Northern California. Um, there's there's lots of people there that are very into like crystals and whatnot. And so like I don't know, uh, and I'm not going to say he specifically endorses any particular thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's definitely in the milieu of the things that he's been exposed to throughout his life that could lead him to some of these conclusions. Yeah, I think there has to be sort of like you got to have a kind of critical mass of them or there has to be like a catalyzing moment where he's like, yep, no vaccine, just homeopathy for me, where you're like, oh, indeed, he does go that way. You know, um, I think I think you're right that he, he got the benefit of the doubt um, about a lot of these things in the past. What about the lying? I mean, is he is he presenting, you know. Is it bad for his team for him to be doing this? He is the, the uh, you know, the, essentially the captain. Um, is it bad for the fans? Is it bad for kids who, you know, have a Rogers jacket and look up to him? Or? Um, I would say as a, a member of the team, yeah, a line is going to degrade that in as the role of the team leader. It, it degrades the... Uh, organizations, the Packers uh, football team, um, because um, once again, it, it, it degrades the trust that we put into them, especially because they carried his water. Um, and you extend this to the, the NFL and anyone else organizations that, mm. that were also privy to this information and kept it under wraps. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it's not like the NFL has like a super great track record of this already. <laughs> they, they kept a lot of the, the concussion stuff. Yeah, con- exactly. Yeah. Uh, under wraps and, um, and tried to sweep that on the table for many, many years. Yeah. Um, once again, it, like it, yeah. It's and the in way their that, business the interest to do that. that is by changing the way that you handle this. Right. So, yeah. You know, somebody might say, you know, you don't know what it's like to be uh, a franchise quarterback and the pressure that entails and all that. And I got a quote from somebody who, went, as soon as I saw it on, on, I didn't see it live on TV, but I saw it posted. I was like, wow, this is the ultimate, you know, re- refutal of, of any sort of attempt to try to get him off the hook on that way. And it's Terry Bradshaw. Terry Bradshaw said, I'll give Aaron Rodgers some advice. It would have been nice if he'd just come to the Naval Academy and learned how to be honest, learned how not to lie, because that's what you did, Aaron. You lied to everyone. I understand immunized. What you were doing was taking stuff that would keep you from getting COVID-19. You got COVID-19. And then he goes off on, he says, you know, ivermectin is a cattle dewormer. Sorry, folks, that's what it is. And so he's basically saying, you know, you should have known better and you shouldn't have lied about this. And he says, he ends it by saying, I'm extremely disappointed in Aaron Rodgers. So when you have a, you know, one of, one of the best quarterbacks, you know, in history, who is a commentator on the sport himself saying that, I think that's kind of telling. The last thing I want to say before we close out is one has to look at what gain, what one gains from lying versus what one has lost right. and if you weigh these two things the scale and what he has lost with the airing of the reality of the thing is much better than any of the you know as he said on um, removal from that scrutiny that he wanted yeah. in the first place so this is a great case um do you want to lead us out with with a uh yeah passage we leave you today with the words of Cicela bach Trust and integrity are precious resources, easily squandered, hard to regain. They can thrive only on a foundation of respect and veracity.